Hello and welcome to the second lesson on the revised data mean hypothesis and as you would expect we've we spent one lesson looking at how we uh, how to explain uh, the revised data mean hypothesis now we're going to be able to we want to be able to evaluate it by the end of this uh, so we need to be able to use research evidence and research theories to uh, evaluate the, the approach and we need to clearly understand um, why it's an improvement on the original hypothesis okay so the tasks that we need to do so one, i want you to complete the rest of the summary sheet on the initial and revised data mean hypothesis and uh, and that needs to be copied into your exercise along with two paragraphs so i want you to imagine you've been asked to evaluate the revised data mean hypothesis and i want you to write two paragraphs doing that and then there's some instructions there um, on whether you're supporting or challenging the hypothesis um, you should comment on that on that evidence and uh, if you want to make additional points that would be even better don't forget that for each uh, um, for each paragraph you write you need to offer a new conclusion that's really important okay so the first uh, few way of um, evaluating the theory is to say okay this is a biological approach um, it's a, and it's an explanation to do with uh, raised and lowered levels of dopamine and what could what can cause those levels and one one pretty obvious uh, thing that could cause um, higher or lower levels of dopamine are genes yeah so so there has been research to, so if we could if we could say look um, people with schizophrenia have got genes that actually cause um, higher or lower levels of um, or that actually cause schizophrenic symptoms, then that would would support the theory. Okay. So Gottsman, that's probably one of the most famous bits of research on this. Gottsman, nineteen ninety one. He found concordance rates. He found if you had, say, for example, one person with schizophrenia, um, and then looked at their relatives, the closer those relatives are genetically, the more likely the other person is to have schizophrenia as well so the more genes you share with someone with schizophrenia the more likely you are to get it that's what concordance rates are so for example two identical twins would roughly have would have a 50 percent chance of there'd be a 50 percent chance of both um identical twins having, twins having schizophrenia so that, that is some supporting evidence for the idea that that genes may be involved in causing dopamine levels and therefore causing schizophrenia on the other hand there's a problem there could be up to 108 different genetic loci or areas in the brain that, that um, or areas on the uh, genome that that might be responsible um, which which therefore tells us that this is going to be very complicated so it's um so again any evaluation that you'd be doing on this you don't have to understand how all the complicated explanations but you need to know and be able to show that you understand that it is complicated so so we've got some supporting evidence and some some slightly slightly opposing evidence that that genes support the uh, dopamine hypothesis second exp uh, explanation or a second way of uh, evaluating this is by using this idea of metabolites so if we're saying high levels of dopamine lead or you know varying levels of dopamine lead to schizophrenia then really we need to be able to measure those and, and say look here's someone here's someone with schizophrenia and here is the amount of, of uh, dopamine in their brains and we're not able to do that really very accurately at the moment so what we can do is we can measure the byproducts of dopamine and they're called byproducts of dopamine are metabolites yeah so the dopamine is used and then it's broken down and it comes into what's known as the cerebral cerebrospinal fluid which and it's taken away from your brain and it goes down your spine and then eventually it leaves your body okay now so if we if we look at if we we look at that fluid if we take that fluid out and and look at it we find a lot of hva in the cerebrospinal fluid that suggests that that person has had a high level of dopamine and if there isn't very much that would suggest that, that person's got a low level of dopamine um so we can see how that could be used su to support uh, the dopamine hypothesis. Um, but there are, there are a couple of problems with that. Okay, one of the problems is that 
uh, it can only be uh, measured. Um, it, can, it needs the, the cerebrus spinal fluid needs to be removed from the body before it can be analysed. And that can only be done by doing a very painful lumbar puncture. It involves quite a big needle that goes into your spine and sucks out the, the, uh, the spinal fluid. So there's not going to be a lot of um, evidence around because people wouldn't necessarily be all that keen on, on having that. But a bigger problem than that is that um, HVA levels can be really affected by people's diets and, um, and drug use. So even if someone's agreed to have, in, have that painful operation to remove the cerebrospinal fluid, if they've, if they've got partic a particularly strange diet or if they use drugs or whatever, then that's going to affect... Um, that's, that's going to affect the level of HVA. So we can't really make a direct connection between the level of HVA and uh, dopamine. So I would, my personal conclusion would be, we, I think we would need to wait and be a bit cautious about these kind of findings until uh, we can accurately measure the amount of um, dopamine that's present in someone's brain. Oops. Okay. Another, pro another problem or uh, um, another issue to consider is the fact that maybe it's not just, maybe it's not just dopamine that's involved. So um, thinking about antipsychotic drugs, drugs that actually help people with schizophrenia, uh, conventional ones, so the original type that were made, they, um, they focus on reducing, or as we'll see later, they focus on reducing the amount of, of dopamine in the brain. Um, and they work for some people, but they don't work for everyone. And then more modern um, antipsychotics, called atypical antipsychotics, they don't just target um, dopamine, they also target serotonin. Um, and they work for other people. Yeah, so some, so some people um, have their dopamine reduced and uh, their, their schizophrenic symptoms reduce. Other people have ser levels of serotonin and dopamine reduced. Um, and their schizophrenic symptoms go down. So that suggests that both dopamine and serotonin are involved in schizophrenia. So what do you think that suggests about the, about the dopamine hypothesis? You might want to, to have a think about that. You might want to pause the video and think, okay, um, there's, quite, there's an interesting explanation of that in the, the textbook as well, on page 115. Final evaluation uh, area for this one is just a just a straightforward idea about whether um, we looked at this a little bit earlier on, I think, in the first video, whether the um, the levels of dopamine are caused by schizophrenia, or whether they or whether they cause schizophrenia. So, does the um, does a high level of dopamine in um, the mesolimbic pathway, does that cause schizophrenia and uh, positive symptoms? Or are the positive symptoms and the high level of dopamine caused by schizophrenia? So that's, um, that's, a, that's, a, conclusion that, that's a, a conclusion that you need to come to yourself about, about what, what you think is um, responsible here. So I'd like you to um, yeah, so ignore this one. This, the task that I've given you was at the beginning of the, uh, the beginning of the PowerPoint. It was on the second slide. Okay. Uh, have, have a lovely week, and I look forward to seeing your, um, seeing your notes and your paragraphs put into your exercise books. Speak to you soon. Bye.